Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the workshop on genomics and health equity. My name is Lucia Hindorf. I'm a program director at NHGRI in the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity Office. I have just a brief a few announcements before we get started with our first talk today. Um, first of all, I'm going to repost our code of conduct for the Zoom meeting in the chat for those of us who are joining, those of uh, you who are joining for the first time today. I also wanted to give you an update on the plan for the breakout groups this afternoon. We're very excited about the enthusiastic response to this workshop. Due, the, due to the large number of registrants, each breakout group will now have its own Zoom link. Everyone should have received an Outlook calendar invite with your assigned breakout group that includes a direct link to the breakout group. You will join the breakout from this link. So when it's time for the breakout groups, we'll remind you of this process and repost the link. So please uh, watch the chat or consult your invite that you received yesterday. And so now we're ready for the first talk of today. And um, it will be given by Vince Bonham, who is the NHGRI Acting Deputy Director and Associate Investigator in the Social and Behavioral Research Branch in the Intramural Research Program. His research focuses primarily on the social implications of new genomic knowledge, particularly in communities of color. He studies how genomics influences the use of the constructs of race and ethnicity in biomedical research and clinical care. Vince, over to you. Okay, great, thank you, Lucia. Um, good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can put my slides up here. So again, uh, good morning or good afternoon where you are in the world. Uh, I am so pleased that you're able to join us today for the second day of the workshop, Building a Genomic Science Health Equity Research Agenda. Again, my name is Vince Bonham. I'm the Acting Deputy Director uh, at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I'm just pleased uh, to, for this workshop and uh, for this conversation that we're having with the community uh, with regards to work, with regards to health equity and genomics. Uh, but I'm also just pleased to, to have the level of engagement across the diversity of the communities that we hope to engage with around issues of health equity research. So I wanna start out my uh, talk um, with my thank yous. Uh, and uh, I want to just thank everyone who's been involved uh, with this workshop, and, but particularly the speakers, the panelists, the moderators, uh, but to also to the participants uh, for your engagement and active involvement, uh, both in asking questions and engagement within the chat. I encourage you today to continue to do that. I also want to thank uh, our sister institute centers and offices who have program directors and staff that have been participating in the workshop. This is important as we move forward uh, with regards to our work across the National Institutes of Health with regards to health equity and particularly health equity and genomics. And finally, I wanna thank our NHGRI staff. We have a number of staff members who have participated in the workshop. But I particularly want to uh, recognize and thank uh, the planning committee for this workshop, uh, starting with our two co-chairs, Dr. Cho and Dr. Su Jin Lee, uh, for their leadership and guidance that they have provided uh, over the last uh, six weeks, seven weeks, as we've been working with them to design and develop this workshop. Um, we appreciate the time and the commitment that you've provided to date uh, with regards to these efforts. Uh, within NHGRI, um, we have a committee, a planning committee. Um, the leads on that committee are Dr. Hindorf and Dr. Madden, but I also want to recognize my other colleagues who are important to this uh, committee. Um, so let's move forward and start to talk about this issue of building a agenda, a research agenda for health equity and genomics. Uh, yesterday, Eric highlighted uh, the strategic vision for the forefront of genomics that was developed by the Institute. And he highlighted uh, the values and principles section. Uh, and there, he focused on one of the areas that I think is extremely important as we move forward our work um, as a research institute with regards to what do we do to actually make the field of genomics a much more equitable. So I think it's worth our time to go back to this specific principle that's included here uh, and highlight that because I think it can help to frame our research agenda. 
to maximize the usability of genomics for all members of the public, including the ability to access genomics and healthcare, engagement, inclusion, and understanding the need of diverse medically underserved groups are required. I highlight in yellow to ensure that all members of society benefit equitably from genomic advances with particular attention given to the equitable use of genomics in healthcare that avoids exasperating and strides toward reducing health disparities. So as I, I would, from my perspective today and talking about developing a research agenda, that we use this principle to help guide the recommendations that are made with regards to what we can do at the National Human Genome Research Institute, but what we can do across NIH to actually to use genomics in an appropriate way to increase equity and reduce inequities that exist in health and healthcare. Yesterday, this slide was shown by, I think, a couple individuals who were speaking uh, as an example of one of the challenging areas that we have within the field of genomic science, of the lack of diversity of diverse ancestral populations in the research. This creates clearly inequities that exist that we must address as a community. We are doing that, but we must continue to figure out how do we do that and what are the new questions that we need to be asking that are related to this lack of diversity within genomics research. So I wanna just take a minute and talk about uh, establishing an equity lens to our research agenda at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Uh, and really to just talk for a minute about what are our research areas with a recognition that as an institute, we cannot do everything that is involving genomics. Uh, now at the National Institutes of Health, across the 27 institutes and centers, genomics has been integrated. Uh, and there's targeted focused work on diseases, there's targeted focused work in various areas. But I wanted to just to re recall for everyone and highlight what is our research agenda? What are our research areas? And so that we think about this from an equity lens of how do we bring an equity lens to our work? So genomic technology development, can we think about what are the questions, what are the issues with regards to equity with regards to genomic technology development? Genome uh, structure and function, understanding the basis of the genome. Is there an equity lens that we can bring to this research area? Computational genomics. This is an area, and we have one of our breakout groups this afternoon focused on equity and data science. That's an important issue and area. How do we think about what are the research questions that are needed to be studied and to explore? And clearly, genomic variation, population genomics, and disease understanding diversity, ancestral diversity, its importance with regards to disease, and what can we do as an institute from an equity lens with regards to this area? Clearly, I believe there is a lot that we can do. Clinical genomics and sequencing, there's work that's already been going on through our CSER program and other initiatives in this area, but how can we advance that work? What are the questions that we need to be asking to create a much more equitable environment for clinical care and genomic medicine implementation and evaluation? What type of implementation research is needed from an equity lens perspective that to advance the work that we're doing? And then finally, the ethical, legal, and social implications. Here, I think this is another area that there's an opportunity to do really great and important work that's advancing on work that's already going on uh, by scholars across the country uh, with regards to thinking about the questions of equity and inequities within the field of genomics, uh, genomic medicine, and what we can do from an ethical, legal, and social perspective in studying those and framing how to advance equity. And finally, which we're not focused on this meeting today, but it clearly has come up throughout day one as training and training a diverse workforce to be involved in genomic science research. This is an important part of equity uh, and is something that we also have to be exploring as we think about a research agenda. So this afternoon, um, each of us will participate in one breakout group um, that is focused on what we see as some of the broad areas for genomics and health equity in our research agenda. 
the social determinants of health and genomic equity. I just want to highlight that NIH is putting much more attention on social determinants of health across um, the institutes with regards to our research program and research agenda. What are the issues that are particular for the field of genomics? Structural factors for genomics that would include barriers of all type with regards to healthcare systems, racism, the variety of structural factors that exist. What can we do? What are the important questions to ask? And the issues of bench to bedside, what can we do to actually bring appropriate genomic care to diverse patient populations, diverse healthcare systems, diverse um, individuals across uh, our country? And then, of course, data science raises a number of issues with regards to sharing data, data science access, information about equity and use um, that we need to explore and understand um, with regards to genomics. And finally, health equity research in LC. We need to make sure that we think about what are the kinds of questions. So this afternoon, we are looking forward to each of the breakout groups coming out with some recommendations. So as a group that we can help to highlight what we see as most important. But I added a, a sixth bullet of other areas. So I'm asking and encouraging you to identify other areas that we have not framed and thought about that are important for our field of genomics with regards to health equity. So again, I just wanna come back to the language from our strategic vision. It's incorporated in our strategic vision. The issues of health equity is a part of our research agenda. And now is the time for us to move that forward. So we look forward to your help and support and guiding us as we move forward in uh, an agenda that's impactful and that will advance the field of genomics and advance genomics and human health. So with that, I just wanna come back and say thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the participants today. And thank you for all that have been involved in this workshop. I'm looking forward to day two. Thank you. Thank you, Vince, for that great talk. We need to move on to the other um, talks in the next session, but please add any questions or comments for events in the chat and we'll try and get to them in the chat. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Judy Cho, one of our workshop co-chairs to introduce the next session. Judy. Thanks, Lucia, and thanks, Vince. Uh, it's really been a privilege to be part uh, of this initiative, the, the launching of this uh, office and center and working with the NHGRI team on developing the agenda for this terribly important initiative. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, first is Dr. James Hildreth, um, who is a renowned immunologist and the 12th president and chief executive officer of the Meharry Medical College. It's a really privilege that he's agreed to, he's accepted our invitation. Um, he's known for his groundbreaking work with AIDS and HIV he was the first African-American to hold a tenured full professorship in basic research at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Hildreth has led Meharry's efforts to ensure that disadvantaged communities have access to COVID-19 testing and vaccines. Graduated from Harvard uh, as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, obtained a PhD in immunology and an MD at Johns Hopkins. And in terms of our interactions with the Meharry team, um, we're, he's been a leader in creating summer research programs for underrepresented minorities and has been active in recruiting undergraduate students for graduate programs. The second speaker in the session is Genevieve Wojcik, who is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore. She is a statistical geneticist and genetic epidemiologist, and her research focus on method development for di diverse populations specifically understanding the role of genetic ancestry and environment in genetic risk in admixed populations. Dr. Wojcik integrates epidemiology, sociology, and population genetics to better understand existing health disparities in minority populations, um, as well as underserved populations generally. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Judy. and. Thank you for the invitation to the organizers to speak this morning. I'm going to try to share my screen and get started. 
Um, that's not correct. Okay, here we go. Um, so as you heard, I'm the 12th president of Meharry Medical College, and I always like to start by reminding people that Meharry has been around for a long time, since 1976, and our main focus has been to provide training opportunities to African Americans at a time when they were not, not available. But our other mission is to provide healthcare to those who otherwise wouldn't get it. And uh, we embrace the mission. We've been Excuse doing Excuse me, Dr. Early. Hildreth, your yes. PowerPoint is not showing properly. Um, About now. Look, looking good. Are we good? You're good to go. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about some current challenges in genomic research and genetic medicine related to health disparities and introduce you to a new partnership that we're really excited about that we think will be very impactful in this, in this area. Uh, as many of you know, African Americans and Hispanics have a higher rate of all the major chronic conditions, uh, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, a number of other uh, disorders as well. And this has led to something that's been born, witnessed by the whole country and the whole world, which is that for African American and Hispanics, COVID-19 was disproportionately impactful in these groups. These are data from summer of 2020. And as you can see, in some places in our country, the ratio of deaths per 100,000 individuals for whites and blacks, it was a tenfold difference if you were a person of color. And New Orleans, Detroit, and Chicago was quite profound. This has been a constant theme for the, for the pandemic. These disparities, as evidenced by the pandemic, are best understood, as you probably heard, through the social determinants of health. And the social determinants of health, of course, are defined as the conditions in which we are born, live, grow, work, and I would add die. And I consider these to be the five degrees of separation, education, healthcare, the built environment, the social and community context, and economic stability. I would like to add a sixth component to this, which is technology, which brings us to six degrees of separation. And technology gap was revealed in the pandemic in the sense that healthcare organizations had to pivot to telemedicine and telehealth. But for many minority communities, the technologies are not available to allow, to allow them to avail themselves of that kind of medicine. Likewise, in schools, schools pivoted to virtual learning. And for a lot of students in minority communities, they were not able to do so because they liked the technology, the simple technologies such as bandwidth, broadband, uh, internet to do so. I would like to add that one of the major technologies that is gonna be impactful for disparities is gonna be genomics and the power of genomics. Developing algorithms for treatment plans, um, using GWAS to find disease associations and identify new uh, diseases and treatments for them. So I think it's quite appropriate that we think about technology as one of those six degrees of separation. So in order to achieve health equity, we need more inclusive genomic research that will lead to improved genomic medicine opportunities for all of us. In other words, as you heard from Mr. Bonham, we've got to make sure that genomic medicine applies to all of us, not just to, to certain members of our population. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen these data. Uh, today, around the country, around the world, actually, genetic information is being used routinely to diagnose diseases, for prognosis of diseases and treatment of diseases. But there's a huge gap in the use of that information or the ability to use that information for minority populations compared to people of European dis, uh, descent. This slide on, on the right shows you that millions of individuals have been involved in GWAS studies, but the vast majority of those individuals are European descent and only a minority of them are persons of color whether you're talking about Africans or Hispanics. Uh, this has implications for genetic screening, for markers of disease and allowing us to intervene early in diseases. It has uh, huge implications for polygenic risk scores and how accurately they can be applied to, to uh, medicine. And personalized medicine and pharmacogenomics will not apply to all of us unless we correct this huge gap in genetic information as it relates to uh, different subpopulations. An example of this is shown here when people used a ClinVar resource um, to look for 
uh, opportunities to identify risk variants. And what they found was that 50% of the observations that were made came from people of European ancestry because the deep sequencing was limited to this population. Uh, and since diverse populations like many of those actual observations made in Europeans, that means that the ability to apply those disease polygenic risk scores or to do this for minority populations was limited. Therefore, in order to change that, we have to have large scale sequencing of diverse populations to make sure we can actually find the rare variants that apply to those populations. Another example of this is uh, individuals who are studying the UK Biobank found that uh, polygenic risk scores when applied to minority populations were much less accurate for persons of color compared to people from other backgrounds. As you can see, these were only 25% as accurate for African people of African descent compared to whites. And this just again points to the fact that genomic data verses are not very diverse. And if they're not diverse, the outcomes or the ability to apply these strategies to minority populations would be much more limited than they otherwise could be. Another example relates to pharmacogenomics. Uh, a few years ago, it was identified that 20 genes affect 80 medicines, prescription medicines that are used routinely um, in people in our country. And it was found that there are certain modifications or variants of some of these markers. That means that certain individuals cannot uh, metabolize drugs and therefore they don't not, they are, they're not very helpful in those groups. For example, Plavix. Plavix had a black mark, black box marker added to its uh, to the drug because it didn't work in people of Asian descent, because 75% of them lack the marker, the genetic polymorphism required to metabolize the prodrug. Likewise, a few years later, it was identified that persons of Alaskan or American natives had a modification of that same marker that made warfarin not work as well in those individuals. And these are just a few examples of how powerful pharmacogenomics can be. And again, if we don't have a diverse database uh, to look for pharmacogenomic opportunities, then it's not gonna be applicable to the whole population. And these just, just a few examples of why this is so very important. So in order to achieve health equity, we need more inclusive genomic research that will lead to genomic opportunities for the whole population, as I said earlier. Uh, we need to make sure that there's clinical, clinically actionable genetic information available for the whole population. We need to make sure that predictive genetic risk scores are accurate for all of us. And again, pharmacogenomics is a big area where we need to make sure that databases reflect the whole population to make sure we can identify those challenges uh, in drugs that we use, but also other opportunities maybe to use drugs selectively in certain populations. In order to achieve this, we need to build capacity and training in, in our communities, diverse communities. We gotta make sure that our genomic studies are large scale and include diverse populations. And very importantly, we gotta make sure that we engage the community and deal with the trust issues that exist for, especially for African-Americans when it comes to medical research and medicine um, in general. So how do, we, how do we get there? First of all, we gotta make sure we engage communities and partner with them uh, and educate them about the genetic research and the implications of it and what it actually means, the, the, the power of it to address diseases and help us treat diseases better. We've also got to address the, the, the realistic and justifiable distrust that populations have, especially African-Americans, for research, research, medical research generally. And there's a lot of basis for that. And we have to acknowledge that the, the mistrust is le legitimate and there's a reasonable basis for it. We've also then got to provide African-Americans with the information they need from trusted partners to move forward. In a recent study, an analysis was done of the online discussions being had by African-Americans regarding genetic research. And what they found was that 20% of people 
were supportive of it and excited about it. 50% were neutral and another 30% were felt negative, had negative feelings about genomics research. What that actually means is there's a great opportunity for us to engage in a conversation with African-Americans to educate them about genomics research and move this agenda forward because a large number of them seem to be willing at least to learn more about genomics research and what it means. You've actually seen this slide before, numerous times I suspect, showing that the large scale genomics research that has been done so far has been for the most part vastly applied to people of European descent, but only a minor fraction of those data coming from people of African descent, only about 2%. Recently, a consortium of scientists produced a, finally produced a complete genome. The genome that was published 20 years ago as a complete genome was actually not complete. And very recently, a consortium of investigators have produced finally a complete human genome. It is now time for us to fill the gaps for diversity in genomics, just as these scientists have produced the full, the full uh, genome for the first time. Another challenge that you heard about is that there's a lack of diversity in uh, researchers that do genetic research. Investigators tend to have a, a personal connection to their ancestry and their country of origin. And this can have a profound effect on how they prioritize the focus of their research. Another major issue, of course, is lack of funds and funding for capacity building and a skilled workforce are some other major barriers, especially when it relates to minority institutions for doing this work. Another huge challenge we have is uh, diversity of the workforce, as you've heard. Less than 3% of all the genetic counselors in our country are African-American, and there are no genetic counseling programs at any of the 107 HBCUs. And quite, this is a really a profoundly disturbing statistic. There are less than 20 African-American medical or, gene or clinical geneticists in the whole country, in the whole country. So I'm excited to make you aware of a program that we're leading at Meharry called the Together for Change Initiative. And it addresses what I think are some of the major challenges of doing the work that needs to be done. First of all, we need to have a collaboration between lots of different organizations, academic, private organizations, uh, pharma companies, et cetera. We also need to invest in capacity in organizations that are trusted by minority communities. And we need to make sure we have databases that reflect diversity. So what the Together for Change initiative is all about is a collaboration between HBCUs, African-American communities, also African, African academics and Af African institutions and industry and corporate partners. We have four major goals in this program and it's all gonna be focused around ethics. We're gonna start with eth ethics. Everything we'll do will be focused on ethics. And at the end of the day, it's gonna guide everything that we do. But there are four major goals we have established within our program. We're gonna establish a K through 12 STEM program in HBC communities to expose children to genetics, genomics research, and careers in genomics. We're gonna launch an HBCU genetics counseling and training program. We're also gonna start a medical genetics fellowship program at our two institutions. This is gonna have a profound effect on the diversity of genetic counselors and medical geneticists in our country. We're also gonna invest in student and faculty research and training uh, at our two institutions. And let me just say, I failed to, to say that Meharry is leading this and we have been involved in this work for the last almost two years in our partnership with Howard University. So the two legacy HBCU medical institutions, Howard and Meharry, are partnering with pharma companies to, to make this possible. But at the centerpiece of all of this, the thing that I'm most excited about is that we're gonna create a database derived from people of African descent of 500,000 genomes or genome exomes, people, 500,000 individuals. We're gonna sequence their genomes and exomes 
and link that to phenotypic data to create the largest database of its kind from people of African descent. And very excitingly for me is this gives us a chance also to do training in, in data science and artificial intelligence and other things. So the impact on training our communities, diversity in the, uh, the fields of genomics and genetics would be profoundly, profoundly influenced by our program. We're really excited about it. Uh, we're about ready to, to announce the launching of this initiative. As I said, it's been two years in the making and I'm really excited to be able to get to this point. I want to acknowledge that over the past two years, there's been a lot of people involved in this work, but there are two individuals who, who warrant special recognition. Dr. Neil Shanker is the Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation at Meharry. And Dr. Lyndon Mitnell is a Senior Scientist at Regeneron. And these two individuals have led this relentlessly to bring us to this point. Uh, we think it's gonna be a historic collaboration between HBCUs and sci our science centers and 10 pharma companies to achieve health equity through genomics research. Really, really excited about it. Um, and I want to thank you for allowing me to share this good news with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move right to Genevieve. Sure, let me just, <clears throat> sorry, bring up my slides, share. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me today. It really is uh, an honor to speak to you about uh, things that we're, we're doing with the research that we're doing, as well as um, some thoughts. And so I'm going to talk today about uh, some of the challenges we have in genomic research um, from a more, I think, from the, the further up the pipeline uh, perspective in terms of the data. So, you know, when I, when I think about these genomic health inequities and the, and the products that we have coming out in terms of polygenic risk scores, any kind of genetic testing, uh, you kind of try to figure out where things went wrong. And as you delve back further and further into the pipeline, you kind of realize that it sort of, it turtles all the way down. And by turtles all the way down, what I mean is that there is this Eurocentric bias in terms of what we accept as the default that has permeated every step along the way, starting with who and how we sample populations, how we even measure their genetics, moving into the methods that we use for genomic discovery. And then, you know, even the way that we translate these discoveries uh, to the clinic. And so I think it really goes to, to down to it. I think this isn't news for anybody here, um, but it goes down to what we accept as the default and sort of how that's built the field. And so when I talk about the default, you know, I think it's important to make distinctions. We all make assumptions when we try to look at human health or assumptions that need to be made for statistical models, assumptions to be made for different conclusions we have. But that is different in my mind than what we accept as the default because the default influences the questions that we ask. It influences who we include in our studies and who we allow to do the studies as well as the systems that we model. And so when we think about equity and moving forward with that, I think it's key to think about what we accept as a default and what are the complex systems that we need to model and sort of have the data for to move outside of this sort of box we're in. And this goes to both the points of the actual data itself and then the participants, but also who we include in the research and how that can inform our research ideas and how we do them. So uh, many speakers today and yesterday have already talked about, talked about the lack of representation for diverse populations in genetic studies. Um, and often we look at the total number of participants, but what I like to look at is the mean and median sample size of these published studies in the GWAS catalog, these genome-wide association studies, sort of the bread and butter um, of a lot of, of these trait analyses. And what I'm showing you here is from 2005, 2020, so a couple years old at this point, but the trends haven't changed that much. And what you can see on the left-hand side is the mean sample size. In the past few years, it's skyrocketed, gotten really high, mostly because of these really large scale biobanks. Um, and sort of these national level efforts. But it's almost entirely in European and European descent populations. The other groups that you see here kind of are way below in terms of orders of magnitude. And then if you go on the right-hand side, looking at the median, this sort of helps you look, you know, peek beyond those really large studies that are few and far between, but then I, th I think the more the, the, the bulk of what is actually being published. And you see the same trends. 
But what I think is really stark to see in these numbers is that it hasn't changed in the past you know, decade about in terms of the median sample size. And this is important because the sample size determines, of course, statistical power along with a lot of other factors. And so it influences what is discovered, what is published, um, and also shows us what this long-term investment means. So a lack of long-term investment in these other groups leads to them being sort of smaller sample sizes, less well-powered, and therefore um, not being able to see things that you can see in the European ancestry groups. Now we can look at the actual numbers as well. This is in 2018, so a few years old, but again, it's pretty similar. And you look at these demographics and look at, I look at the way the breakdown about 78% of individuals in the GWAS catalog are European or European descent, 11% Asian, and then only 1.3% Hispanic Latin American and 2.4% African African American. And you know what I really want you to take home from this is that this is not representative of the United States. It's not representative of global demographics. It's really not representative of much at all that's based in reality. And I think that's a, a major problem. Um, and what I hope to show you in this presentation is sort of what happens, what the downstream, the cascade effects of this are um, and how it's more than just about discovery, but it's even about how we're even able to model complex systems. And so I also wanna to touch on one thing, I think that, that goes to what was brought up yesterday and we talk about accountability or being able to assess equity is that a major barrier for this is actually our imprecision of even being able to describe the study populations. Uh, when we think about, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm always gonna throw this in there, that it's really important for us to know these populations and a major challenge is to know whether our study populations and how they relate to the target populations of who we're trying to actually help. And this can include, of course, race, ethnicity, that's sort of the, 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 big, the big factor. We don't really describe it well, we are inconsistent. It's hard to look across databases for this. Genetic ancestry, but also geographic location, social context in general, which is a whole you know, big, big field there and other basic demographics. And so this can create issues and barriers to really achieving this health equity if we can't even describe the populations that we're trying to help and work in. And we can see this in the way that the data is aggregated. This is from the GWAS catalog. Um, they harmonized um, all of the published GWAS at this point and in order to do that, they had to define the groups to have some sort of level of, you know, to count. And what I think is important here is that to have some account, they had to combine numerous constructs that are not exactly the same. So some are overlapping, but not exactly the same. And so this is just the definition for European and European sort of ancestry backgrounds. And what you have here is they've combined genetic ancestry, something done computationally with a reference population, perhaps, uh, geography, which is Europe nationality, such as Dutch, as well as race, so Caucasian and white in this case. And so when you dump all these concepts together, you know, it's sort of what had to be done at this stage for this sort of, for this end goal, uh, but it does sort of muddy the waters when you're looking at trying to bring evidence bases together um, to better understand what's going on. So back to our presentation, I work a lot right now on polygenic risk scores, um, and it is nobody's surprise that the lack of diversity for GWAS and for other genomic studies uh, reaches into project risk scores. So this is a few years old um, in terms of the numbers, 2019, but uh, Larry Duncan et al. looked at published PRS and they found that European ancestry studies were vastly overrepresented. So about 460% compared to the world population. And so 67% of published studies looked only in European ancestry groups. So the whole publication was just on European ancestry uh, groups. What I think is really damning is that if we took all of the published papers that had any individuals included who were African, Latino, Hispanic, or indigenous peoples, and they combined all of them, it's only 3.8% of publications. Um, and so with that, you have you know, several continents being combined um, and only 3.8%. So really there is a problem. And I'm not gonna go too far into right now the actual problem because I think other speakers have, have spoken on this already, but the idea is that if you train your polygenic risk scores in a European ancestry background and you apply it to other groups, you do worse. And so having the majority done in one population inherently creates a product and a tool, this risk calculation, uh, risk estimator that does worse in other groups, which could exacerbate 
health disparities. And Alicia Martin um, really well put it on this paper in terms of what can happen. Now, how badly it does depends on the outcome. It depends on a lot of things, but it does worse. Um, and so this is a problem. Now it's just, I think for most people, when you think about this, it's usually chalked up to LD or L little frequencies, but I wanna sort of add on to that, that it's actually more complicated than just these sort of random factors due to genetic drift. So if we look at, this is PAGE, this is a, a, a polygenic risk score for BMI that we've applied in PAGE, which is the population architecture using genomics and epidemiology study, a long running study from NHGRI, looking at um, minority populations in the United States. And what you see here is, first of all, the performance of this risk score is not great. Um, I also realize that BMI is not the most clinically relevant of an outcome, but I think it helps illustrate a point. And what I really wanna point out to you here is that you, know, you have these, these groups that are stratified by their self-identified uh, race and ethnicity, and they're split out here in terms of you know, those groups. And it's important to note that for this R squared, so the model fit on a continuous scale, there is a lot of different performances. You know, some people, some people do, it does badly and sometimes it does worse. Um, and then if you do it on a more dichotomous way of looking at it, so obesity versus not, uh, severe obesity versus not, uh, you have the AUC for that prediction. But what I want to point out to you here, which is sort of a, will illustrate to you how it gets more complicated, is that you have the Asian um, group here. And so you have a really low R squared of 0 0.017. And you know, that's one of the worst in, in this out of all the different groups. Uh, but when you dichotomize it, it goes up. It's one of the highest in terms of the AUC. So why is this? Why is there this difference between if you even include it on a continuous scale versus a binary? And what does that mean? And again, I am going to get very obnoxious to this line because this is my field, but this, it's about the epidemiology of the trait in the population. So what I'm showing you here is the PRS decile and the proportion within that decile that is obese. So BMI greater than or equal to 30. And <clears throat> pardon me, what you see here is that um, because the prevalence of obesity is so much lower in the Asian group compared to the other groups, that even though the model fit on continuous scale is very poor, um, it's able to discriminate between obese and not obese just because of the low prevalence. Now, this isn't new in terms of you know, dynamics and, and relationships between these different metrics. Um, it's just so to show that polygenic risk scores and genetics in general are not fundamentally different from the rest of epidemiology and the way we think about things. And therefore it's important to understand the specific epidemiology of the different groups. It's not just about linguistic equilibrium. It's not just about allele frequencies, but it's about what's actually going on in those groups, which requires expertise. Um, and so some and the other things to think about on this level, I think often we think about tools just performing worse. They're always gonna perform worse, um, but I think it's important to understand why, and it's not just a matter of the, the LD. And we can see this in more clinically relevant outcomes. This is a, a comparison of some risk scores for coronary artery disease, uh, looking at different groups. And what they show is that there's an elevated risk for this, these outcomes in non-European ancestry groups. If you look at African-Americans and Hispanic uh, ethnicity as it's titled here, uh, but there's decreased performance. So again, you have this relationship where you're possibly giving folks elevated risk estimates, um, but the performance is worse. And so what are you actually giving them in terms of a product? And so, you know, I, I really wanna delve in even further and show you sort of how complicated things can get. And sort of, it's not just about a lack of representation, but also a lack of large scale data sets with that representation that require a breadth of information. And so, you know, we know things, PRS perform differently by race ethnicity. What happens if we look within a group? So just within one population, how do their sort of admixture portions make a difference? Um, and then how also do you have complications, the heterogeneity in the environment within that one group? So how can basically how com more complicated could it possibly get? The answer is very complicated. And so for this, we're gonna look at the Hispanic Latino group. This is again in page, uh, this is about 22,000 individuals. And so I think it's important for us to note when I say we're looking in these Hispanic Latino groups and we think about genetics, what are we actually talking about when it means the genetics of Hispanic Latino groups? 
And so here I'm showing you a principal components analysis. Each dot is a person. They have all self-identified as Hispanic Latino. And what you can see is that there isn't one cluster. There's a lot of diversity. And I think what's important to note is that if we just had the Hispanic Latino label, and that's it, that's all we allow people to self-identify as, that's where it stops. Um, that same level of, of detail as other groups, perhaps, uh, you would fail to see the bigger picture. And that bigger picture is that if you let people identify themselves further, you can see substructure and you can see sort of what's going on and the, the complete uh, heterogeneity and substructure that is included in this one population or this one self-identified group. So another way of looking at this is admixture proportions. Each vertical line on this plot is a person. It is colored uh, by the proportion of their genome that is due to a specific continental background. And so you have um, indigenous to the Americas, you have uh, European and you have African. And so what you see in the sort of middle part here, that strip looking at Hispanic Latino individuals is that there is a wide spectrum. If I, you know, picked one person out of that group, it could be any range of proportions. Uh, and then if you let people split themselves up into further, you know, identifying themselves, you can look at right below, which is the, um, for, for Page, people could further identify themselves in the Caribbean, uh, for Puerto Rican, Cuban, and Dominican, uh, and on the continent, Mexican, and then um, these studies combined Central America and South America uh, because of the numbers. And so you have this heterogeneity. Now, again, I wanna note that if you, if you picked one person out of this, that I could not tell you how they further self-identify based on the proportions alone. But there are differences on average that can contribute to differences in terms of the polygenic risk score. And why is that? So if we look at these polygenic risk scores, even within one group, so this is a polygenic risk score that has been stratified by folks who identify as self-identify Hispanic Latino. It has been standardized in terms of, you know, centered and one standard deviation or normalized there. You see this relationship between ancestry and the score where folks who have more indigenous ancestry have a higher score. And it's not a real relationship, meaning it's not actually contributing to helping predict anything. When you explicitly adjust for the ancestry and you explicitly adjust for the specific ancestry that we're talking about here, you do the best in terms of your model fit. Um, and so it's important to note that there can be this sort of uh, incorrect relationship even within one group that needs to be properly modeled. And you can see here, you can adjust for the top three PCs, but it really does the best if you, do, if you explicitly look at the ancestry. And so for this, you know, I wanted to, to show that really it's about the ranking and it changes. And again, you can give these false uh, relationships and estimates of risk for all of this. All right. So, you know, I only have a, a minute left, so I'm gonna really go through this very quickly in that it gets more complicated. So if we look at what this polygenic risk score is actually explaining, you know, is it explaining the outcome? Is it explaining the, the ancestry? You can get an estimate. But what I think is important for us to note is that if you split people up more granularly, such as Mexico, Puerto Rico, the proportion of that risk score, the variance of that risk score that's being explained by different components changes. And it further changes when you think about um, environmental variables as well. So not only further identified in terms of these groups, but then the environmental variables which are different prevalences in those groups. And so one thing that we wanna think about too for environment that might be very specific to different groups is sort of immigration, length of residence in the United States. If we go back to that BMI, what we see is that um, there's a relationship between the length of residency in the mainland US, and this is consistent with all Hispanic Latino groups. And so how would this affect a polygenic risk score? And so to do this, you know, there are really great people working on this. It's the study that was led by Lindsay Fernandez Rhodes and Kristen McArdle published last year. And what they found that if you look at the relationship between you know, polygenic risk score and immigration, first of all, the actual risk score and the model does differently, different on in different uh, backgrounds based on, even after you adjust things, the effect of the risk score is different. Again, by background, it's not a monolithic group. There are differences in the background. And then a really complicated factor on top of that is that there is an interaction between immigration and the PRS um, for this as well. So immigration affects the, the strength of the PRS and ability to predict in the Cuban uh, Americans, but not in the Dominican. So there is sort of this, again, interactions, interactions and heterogeneity. 
And what this means is that the, the systems are very complex. You need these diverse data sets. It's not enough just to have a very little sort of long data set in terms of numbers, but it really requires a breadth of information that I think is lacking, which really needs a long-term investment uh, for these studies. Now I am out of time, so I'm just going to sort of wrap this up. But you know, I think again, I just want to sort of hammer home that it's that our main challenge is not just having a lack of data that has these sort of tick boxes for different populations, but to have a rich set of data for all of those different populations that spans not only sort of the genetics, but also more individual factors, more structural factors. Um, and that really is, I think, one of the main challenges we have. So to leave us out, you know, before I told you that the demographics in the GWAS catalog uh, were not representative of anything based in reality. Uh, they're not really based on the population demographics. They're not related to the US population, um, but they are actually related. They're, they're rep representative of us, the federally funded faculty. And I know that, you know, many of us did not get into this for selfish reasons, but this goes back to what we accept as the default. You know, people in general, um, try to have their own lived experiences. And if you have a lot of people who have a certain lived experience, it's harder to, to model these systems that are sort of different to them. So I think that goes to the point about training we had before. Um, and so thank you again, as we move towards precision health, you know, precise for whom for us to remember. And thanks for everybody here, especially uh, Lindsay and Kristen for the immigration stuff and Misa for help with the PRS. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth and Dr. Wojcik. I have um, a few minutes to moderate some Q&A that have come through in the chat. I'd actually like to start with a comment that was made yesterday. Um, and the idea is that we're looking to advance some really important areas of research, but how do we keep these this research accountable to people? Um, and so maybe we might start with Dr. Hildreth first and then Dr. Wojcik. Sorry, Lucia. How do we keep? Actually, so, can I clarify that a little bit, please? Oh, sure thing. It was Dr. Clayton's. Yep, um, go ahead. You know, we've talked a lot about how people um, are, uh, there, your slide that showed that only 20% of people thought that research was, this research was a good idea, and 27% thought it wasn't, and another big chunk didn't, didn't have an opinion. Um, I think we have to think about how to, and you also showed the, um, co the cover of the book about Henrietta Lacks. We have a lot of distrust to talk about here. We heard a lot yesterday about how various communities um, were, uh, were not, did not think that this research was uh, desirable or, or was problematic. Um, how do we get to a situation, and I, I think we really as a community desperately need to do this, to figure out how we find out um, what under what conditions this research would be set, ex, acceptable and how do we make it accountable? Because frankly, I think that's a gigantic uh, unmet need. Dr. Clayton, uh, I totally agree with you. And I spent a lot of time over the last two years speaking to minority groups about the vaccine because they were hesitant and didn't trust the the how they how it was made and all that and my conclusion from all the work that I've done and my work in HIV is that you have to have trusted messengers and we can't have trusted messengers unless there are more people involved in the research who look like me um, you know and I think until we change that and that's what this together for change initiative is all about that we're doing with the pharma companies is to try to change the 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 composition or the disposition of people who do this work. In my opinion, genomics research and the, the insights we're gonna gain from it are gonna change how we treat a lot of diseases. And we gotta make sure that all of us benefit from it equally. But in order to do so, we have to have more people involved in the work that are trusted by communities. I call it leading from behind, right? You gotta identify those folks who are trusted in their communities and let them lead the efforts but you gotta empower them with the right information and the right tools to do so. And that's the approach that we're taking. So your point is well taken, but it comes down to me to having trusted messengers to lead the effort. And that's what we're trying to achieve. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Dr. Wojcik, would you like to comment on that as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't really have much to add to that. I think that really sums it up. I, the only other thing that I could possibly add to it is that I think that there can be a slight paternalism when it comes to not uh, believing people when they have reservations. And I think that a lot of researchers just go ahead with things because they go, well, they don't really, they don't actually understand the risk. It's not that much risk. And I think that's doing everybody a disservice. Um, and there's really no place for that. It, it's, it's, it's our job not to go ahead and do what we think is best, but to work with communities um, and, and sort of jointly figure out what's the best for, for them. Absolutely. Terrific, thanks. Um, Dr. Hildreth, I wanted to point out a number of comments in the chat, congratulating you on your new effort and also pointing out similar challenges and opportunities at some of our other participants institutions such as Hispanic serving institutions. Um, there is a specific question about the plans to create a sample size of about 500,000 African ancestry genomics databases. So um, given that Africa is extremely diverse, how are you sampling and how representative will the data be for um, all of Africa? And do you think that um, undersampling and making inference for Af entire Africa could lead to unintended consequences? I don't, I don't think we're inferring or, or hoping to have a, have a sample or data set that reflects all of Africa. But I think that having sites here in the United States and collecting samples from the African continent will make our database much more uh, useful and powerful. So we're not, we're not trying to necessarily sample all of the African continent. We've identified at least five academic institutions that are gonna partner with us to do this work. We think the combination of African-Americans and Africans will make our data set, along with the phenotypic data, a, a very powerful one indeed. Thank you. Um, and a question for Dr. Wojcik, are the same African or African-American and Hispanic Latin American people's data used repeatedly or more often across GWAS studies? Would that tend to reinforce conclusions based on a relatively small number of clinical experiences as well? Yes, they, they are. But I, I can't speak to whether that's more often than in European ancestry groups, because, you know, of course, the big ones are UK Biobank, it's the same people being used over and over again. Um, so... So yes, it's sort of it would it would behoove us to really look at new studies and sort of see where the gaps are beyond these sort of very um, large, all-encompassing labels to see where the, the patches are, um, you know, within that to, to see better what's going on. Thank you. I'm looking. There's a, there's a couple of other um, questions about. Um, whether, for example, if before we adjust away ancestry from PRS, do you think we need a first check of genetic ancestry itself could sometimes be associated with risk of certain outcomes? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I actually, uh, I have slides that I didn't include the study, but yeah, the epidemiology matters. So, you know, for one metric trait for BMI, um, indigenous ancestry does not predict anything, but for um, height, it does. And so you can imagine more maybe clinically relevant traits being the same thing where it, again, it depends on what your goal is for a risk score, whether it's just prediction and you don't care where the predictive power comes from, then yes, you might not need to adjust with that specific ancestry. But if you really want something that can be portable across populations um, and really have separate terms in that prediction model, then maybe you do need to adjust for it. So again, uh, yeah, it, it all depends and you need to know that better. Thank you. Dr. Hildreth, one last question for you. How are you going to convince people about genetics where the evidence is much more elusive when it's very difficult to do that with vaccines when the evidence is so compelling? Uh, my approach to this has been to not make assumptions about what people will understand or not understand. Mm -hmm. When science is communicated in a way that an ordinary person can get it, they get it. And that's what I did in my role in the mayor's press conferences and my role on the national level is to not make assumptions about people or presume that they won't understand something. And there's a certain amount of cultural humility that's been lacking in what we do. And what we're gonna to bring to the table and the work that we're doing is that cultural humility to assume that an ordinary person, if you explain it to them in a way they can understand, they will get it. Genomics has to be something that all of us take part in. It's, it's, it just has to be that way. And we have to do the work. It's a heavy lift, but we can do it. And we start with a humility to assume that if we do our job correctly and break it down in a way that people can understand it, we're gonna be successful. I have no doubt about it. 
Thank you for that comment. I think it reinforces many earlier discussions we had about this kind of going back to um, relationships among people and partnerships. Um, thank you both for some very interesting and thought-provoking talks. I will I will note that we weren't able to get to all the comments and questions in the chat. If you are able to stay on and would like to look through some of them, um, please feel free. NIH is also going to be capturing um, the comments in the chat for further consideration. So um, let's give Dr. Wojcik and Dr. Hildreth a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to you both. Okay, and next we are moving on to the, the next um, panel on structural factors. And one minute here while I get everything set up on my end. Okay, so this is um, a panel that is um, intending to follow up directly on the previous uh, terrific talks that we just heard. Um, I'll be doing some brief introductions. So first, Kellen Baker is the executive direct director of the Whitman Walker Institute, which is the research policy and education arm of Whitman Walker, a federally qualified community health center in Washington, DC. Renee Begay is a professional research assistant at the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health at the University of Colorado School of Public Health, while studying as a master's of public health and Bloomberg scholar with the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, focusing on the topic of childhood obesity. Faith Fletcher is Assistant Professor in the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine and a Senior Advisor to the Hastings Center, a leading bioethics research institute. Neil Risch is the Lamont Family Foundation Distinguished Professor in Human Genetics, Founding Director of the Institute for Human Genetics, and Professor and former Chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco. This panel will be moderated by Carol Horowitz, Professor of Population Health Science and Policy, Professor of Medicine, and a practicing general internist at the ICANN Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is the founding dean for gender equity in science and medicine and the director of the New Institute for Health Equity Research. Dr. Hor Horowitz, over to you. Hi, um, it's an honor to be with you all today. <clears throat> um, we're gonna do a, a brief um, round robin where, where we're each gonna um, give our reactions to the excellent talks we had, and, um, and then we're gonna open up for Q&A. Um, I'd like to start out by um, briefly saying that I think what we've learned from our outstanding speakers is that systems are perfectly designed to get the results they get. And that's why we have the problems we have right now. Um, as Dr. Hildreth said, we need to uncover impact structures underlying inequities to ensure that the diverse populations who we work with are among the first, not the last, to benefit from scientific advances. We heard about the need to diversify who is in studies and who is on a research team. And we heard some, but I wanna also highlight that part of dismantling harmful structures is diversifying who gets to ask the questions, what questions we ask, and how the answers are used to inform larger policies, systems, and the environment. So I'm just gonna give a brief example and, 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 then, um, and then the rest of us will share. Um, so um, the example I'll give is what is a gene environment interaction? And for a lot, you know, for someone newer to genomics, a lot of what I hear is that the environment is something like blood pressure. But, you know, outside our genetic circle, that's not what people consider the environment. And Dr. Wojcik shared some other examples of it. So what about the built environment in terms of where people live? We heard yesterday about <clears throat> April 1 gene variants uh, that are ne nearly exclusively found in people with African ancestry and they confer an increased risk for kidney failure. This is true. You should also know that residential segregation leads to more black people living in neighborhoods where people breathe more polluted air and that air is toxic to kidneys. So our community partners were the ones who said to us, wait a minute, this April 1 kidney disease, what about where people live? And sure enough, when we looked, we found that air pollution and APOL01 are, so, are associated with additive detrimental impact on kidney function. So with open minds and diverse teams, we can change the way we look at things and then the things we're looking at will start to change. So um, Dr. Baker, would you like to add? Sure, thank you, Dr. Horowitz. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I very much appreciate all of the perspectives and expertise that has been shared. I'm coming specifically from the perspective of working closely with sexual and gender minority populations, which I think has both some specific considerations in the realm of genomics and also 
is really emblematic of a lot of the other challenges that we see in terms of populations that historically have been marginalized, excluded, or exploited, and the ways in which we are invisible in genomic medicine, genomics research, and uh, to your point, Dr. Horowitz, where these structural problems continue to shape the degree to which the stories of different communities are or are not heard. In terms of some of the structural factors that I think about in relation to how genomic medicine and research is serving or often not serving diverse communities, really thinking about things such as what questions are being asked. The questions that we're asking are literally framing, to your point about systems, you know, they are designed to get the results that they get. And the questions that we ask really do both express our worldviews, but also shape our expectations and our understanding of the answers that we get back. What populations are being included? Are we even thinking about different populations in relation to genomics? Or is it sort of, honestly, business as usual in uh, scientific research where so many populations, communities of color, women, children, LGBTQ people, sexual and gender minorities, people with disabilities have simply just been overlooked. And so thinking about ways to include them both as populations that are being uh, partnered with in research efforts and to the point about diversifying the workforce, making sure that folks with lived experience of the, the concerns of the issues that we're trying to investigate are really being represented um, among the, the researchers themselves. Specifically about the experiences of sexual and gender minority populations, one of the biggest structural barriers that we run into is a question of mistrust, the degree to which so many members of sexual and gender minority communities, which is common uh, across a, a number of populations experiencing disparities, the point about uh, the experience of Henrietta Lacks, for example, and the, the exploitation of the data um, and experiences and lives of African Americans in genomic research, um, there is a great deal of mistrust of what the purpose of the scientific enterprise is and how the data will be used, how the data will be communicated back to actually turn into benefit for communities. And from a more personal level, just in terms of thinking about our own understanding of who we are, um, thinking about what is the truth of our lives? What is the truth about who we are and where does it live? So in genomic medicine, we often go back to the genome to try to identify what is it that makes us who we are? And there are some of the ways in which the genome really does tell us a lot of important truths. And there are some of the ways that a myopic focus on the genome may actually miss a great deal of what makes us human, what makes us who we are. For example, uh, me as a transgender person, if you were to look at my chromosomes, I haven't had a karyotype, but if you look at my chromosomes, you may well conclude that I should be categorized as female. There are a lot of ways in which that's not actually true. Um, and the question of how do we understand the relationship between sex, gender, my own identity, my interactions with the environment, and what my genome says about me is a very serious uh, issue for a lot of people, not just sexual and gender minority populations, but thinking too about the, the desire to locate race in the genome, the desire to locate and eradicate disability by focusing on the genome, and really thinking about the ways in which we need to make sure that a focus on genomic medicine and research does not become an excuse to look for individual solutions to what are really structural problems. Race is not encoded in the genome. Racism is the problem. Anti-LGBT bias is not something that we should be looking for. What is the gay gene? What is the trans gene? Because the subtext of that is how do we get rid of it? We should be looking, about the ways, looking at the ways in which these structural factors are making it possible or making it impossible for communities to access and benefit from genomic medicine and research. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Dr. Begay? Thank you, and thank you to the organizers for allowing me to be on this panel. Um, so I guess the title of our talk is Structural Factors, and I feel like I struggled fi figuring out what it is that I wanted to say for this panel. And thank you, Kellen. I feel like you kind of summed up <laughs> everything that I wanted to say. Um, but coming from my tribe, the Navajo Nation, located in Arizona. I grew up on the reservation early on in my life, but I also lived off the reservation as well. So I've had the pleasure and experience of being able to 
you know, get running water when I was off the reservation, but then having to not have electricity and running water when I was on the reservation and engaging in my cultural practices when I was at home. So I have a varied background and um, I also don't have a PhD at this point in time. Um, and I struggle with that. I struggle with that power imbalance of not having a PhD and everybody, you know, coming to the table and already having a PhD. But I also feel like my background gives me insight into what it is that genomics medicine can contribute to my community, to indigenous people. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I think is one of the barriers is that there's no diversity within these sessions, within these meetings, these really important meetings that are really happening. Are we really in being inclusive of community members and people who have, let's say, just master's degrees or just bachelor's degrees? Um, because it's it's a long haul to get a PhD. It's a lot of work and a lot of uh, time and money and effort and away from our communities as Native people. And to get a PhD, you have to leave all of that behind and sort of water down what who you are, your culture. And I think that's one of the things that I've been struggling with in this meeting is that there's not a lot of Indigenous representation. Um, but I can also we apologize for the disconnect, everybody. Renee doesn't seem to be back. I'm here. Oh, Renee, we are we are sorry for the disconnect. Um, could you um, that we all we all got we all got lost. Um, so we're going to ask if you can just give maybe another you know thirty seconds to recap your most important things because we heard most of what you said. And then we're going to turn it over to the other two speakers, and then we're going to ask some questions. It'll cut a little bit into the next talk, but we all deserve a chance to say what we need to say. So Renee, can you finish up, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think to sum up, I, I recently saw a quote saying that there's never been a lack of talent or expertise or understanding within our tribal communities, just a lack of resources. Um, and also to say that Genomics has been a part of indigenous communities for a long time. I think we've understood genomics and genetics from you know, a holistic point of view. And yeah, we didn't have necessarily the term genomics and we didn't have this fancy technology, but we understand and we, we want to engage in genetics research when it's the right time and when it's the right question that will really help and benefit our communities. Thank you. And I, and I apologize on mistitling you. I guess there are different kinds of doctorates. And what you said, you have a different kind of doctorate than I do, but ex exactly as valuable. Um, Faith? Sure. Thank you for having me here today. And I appreciate all the remarks from the panelists um, before and um, during this panel around health equity and genomics. So I'll just um, comment on a few things, really aligning my remarks with Dr. Hiltress ethos that we need a more inclusive genomics research that will lead to improved genomic medicine opportunities. That really resonated with me. So in my research, I examine ethical and social implications of biospecimen collection and research processes with underrepresented populations. Similar to what Dr. Baker said, I also traditionally come um, from the field of HIV, working with Black women with multiple intersections, um, overlapping vulnerabilities at the intersections of race, gender, um, economic inequities, as well as sexual orientation in some cases. Um, so my interest in um, conducting and using my lens is to really understand unique concerns um, of communities, informational needs, access barriers, as well as structural and intersectional barriers experienced by these groups participating in genomics research. So are there issues unique with individuals um, that we traditionally view as having overlapping vulnerabilities or intersectional vulnerabilities? And how do we use that information to tailor it to um, protocols and practices? I wanna amplify the importance of also grounding health equity in all phases of genomics research to examine these complexities surrounding multiple forms of participant vulnerability rooted in structural inequities. So we, don't, we know and we've heard over the past two days that in the absence of participant voice, there is the potential for overestimating or underestimating even participant risk and personal agency, which can lead to overexposure to research harms or overprotection of limitations and research benefits. So essentially we're hearing about community informed benefits as well as community informed harms. We want participants to really characterize their perceptions of research harms, 
benefits and justice in research? What does that look like um, when we think about conceptualizing and operationalizing research justice and research injustice from the perspectives of participants? And finally, I'll um, highlight if we're truly committed to building a trustworthy and equitable genomics research enterprise. We must listen more to the communities that we serve, engage them in partnership, respect their contextual knowledge, as my colleague has mentioned. Um, we must reflect inward to improve our structural competency, borrowed from Metzl and Hansen from the field of medicine. And we are all morally and ethically responsible to work collectively to dismantle harmful narratives, harmful frames, practices and policies across the research continuum. Thank you, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, and I hope it's okay with all of you. I switched over to first names so that we all, we, we, we can, uh, so we're all on equal footing. Um, Neil, if you could um, give some brief comments, please. Hi, everyone. Um, this, has been, this has been a very full conversation the last couple of days, and I don't wanna, I'm gonna try to avoid repeating a lot of the things that have been said already. Um, what I'm going to try to do is maybe give a, a little bit more of a framework on this topic, which is about inequities. <clears throat> and I just wrote down some points I wanted to make. Uh, first of all, disparities and inequities are defined in terms of social and not genetic categories. Lack of genetic information is just one source of lack of information in terms of health. Um, you, can't, you can't recruit subjects into studies based on genetic ancestry, um, but only on social categories, which are the ones that matter in the first place. Um, and in this, in this broad topic, it's not really just an issue of a genomic health inequity, but health inequities much more broadly. And I'm gonna discuss that further in a minute. In terms of health equity and inequity, I see four, um, this was already brought up yesterday, um, but four uh, areas which I think uh, can be broken down into. First, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and outcome. A gaps in equity can occur, I feel um, gaps in inequity, in equity can occur for primarily two reasons. First, gaps in knowledge. And this is related to gaps in who has been included in research studies in the first place. And then second, gaps in access to the tools and benefits of that knowledge, um, which is primarily socioeconomic and uh, political in nature, and is uh, most directly related to access to quality medical care. In terms of prevention, so regarding, again, this is regarding genomics. Um, then we're talking about genetic predictors of disease. So in the Mendelian case, uh, for example, carrier screening, a knowledge gap may exist because founding mutations in specific race or ethnic groups have not been identified because they haven't been included in disease sequencing studies. Um, this may also apply to incidental findings that come from exome or genome sequencing studies that are diagnostic. Now in the non-Mendelian case, equity is related to genetic ancestry, for example, We've heard a lot about this already. Polygenic risk scores um, based on whites are not always equally applicable to other race or ethnicity groups, um, and they have been generated primarily in white populations. This represents a gap in knowledge. But in both cases, there can also be a gap in access depending on the health provider setting that individuals exist in. Next is diagnosis. So for example, exome yeah, We're just gonna ask you just 30 more seconds, please, because there's a lot of questions coming in. Thanks. Okay, so, sorry. Um, so I'm not sure what to say now. So diagnosis, so exome sequencing um, to diagnose previously undiagnosed disease. This is still not a settled issue, but it appears that genetic ancestry probably, probably plays only a small role at best. So that's something that needs to be considered. But again, lack of access to, to technology would be um, more likely. Um, treatment, we already heard about pharmacogenetics. There can be knowledge gaps there too, but also gaps to access. Um, in terms of outcome, um, again, large inequities occur just because of the healthcare setting people live in, not because of the technology in and of itself. So Neil, on that, so, on that topic, um, if I can, um, I think you know when you were just talking about where people live, um, one of the questions that's coming through the chat and that's coming from NHGRI <laughs> is, when we think about structural factors, can you all give a little bit of information about some of the kind of macro level factors that we need to pay attention to? So can, can, I, can, I, can I just give my final comment here, which sure. is my bottom line? Thank you. So um, it's critically to actually determine the utility and benefits through evidence-based research of each aspect that I talked about above. And I can give you examples of pharmacogenetic tests for which there's the ancestry relationships and so on, which turn out to be ineffectual because you can't lower the dose because, because of side effects, because if you do, you reduce the effectiveness of the drug. So <clears throat> there was a National Academy report on evidence framework for genetic testing. 
And before you define what inequities are, I think we better have a discussion about <clears throat> what is actually the real utility of all the genetic testing that we're talking about before we can discuss inequities. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, one, of the, one of the questions that's come across is, we're thinking about how to diversify the workforce. We're thinking about how to diversify who we're working with, the questions we're asking. These macro level factors that you all are talking about, what's underpinning health inequities to begin with, structural racism, other kinds of inequities. How do you, how do you guide genetic research as the NHGRI in, in thinking about structural larger macro inequities? Who would like to start with that? Faith, you're nodding your head. I don't know if you'd like to begin. I'm just an affirmative um, panelist. <laughs> so yeah, happy to start. Um, I'll say um, when we're talking about populations and being really sensitive to the needs and complexities and unique concerns and potential barriers and even resiliencies of populations, we have to make sure we're centering um, diverse research teams. Um, and part of what um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Baker mentioned is that um, if you're thinking about working with black women living with HIV or other sexual minorities, you should also think about your research teams, um, who's in leadership positions. Um, this goes beyond having project coordinators and um, even recruiters who are from sexual minority communities. So we need this representation, um, not only as a matter of justice, but also this representation matters for our science. We know that diversity improves the quality of the science. So I'll just say um, that's one, I guess, policy recommendation in terms of ensuring and holding people accountable to having diverse teams with expertise as well as social identities. And I think we can do that through our scores, our NIH um, impact scores. Um, and that's one way to evaluate it. Thank you. Callan, did you have something you wanted to add here about this or one of the other topics? Sure. One of the things that really comes to my mind is this question of mistrust, because we talk about it a lot. You know, I brought it up. It's something that comes up quite often. You know, communities do not trust researchers. And I really want to emphasize that that places the burden back on researchers. This is an adaptive response from communities to decades or centuries of exploitation, abuse, and violence. And so it is not appropriate to say, well, those populations are hard to reach. I tried, but I couldn't. That is our problem. That is a problem for researchers to think through and solve. It is not incumbent upon communities to change, to accommodate our desires to talk to them about often very personal and very, you know, sort of uh, can be complicated, can be sensitive, all of this information um, related to genomic medicine and research. And so I really think this We've seen a lot of this around COVID, right? The, the uh, conversations about communities that are hard to reach or just aren't participating, or we think they won't participate. But really it often is that people simply aren't asking, researchers simply aren't asking in ways that resonate with and benefit communities. And so I think the, that, that structural factor of mistrust that is deeply rooted in structural racism is deeply rooted again in centuries of violence and exploitation. It is incumbent upon us to figure out how to reach out to communities and communicate the benefits and the reasons that we are doing this research. It is not incumbent upon communities to simply say, oh, that seems reasonable. Sure, why don't you? Mistrust is adaptive. And so I think that it is very important for us to be thinking about real strategies to communicate the benefits and to meet communities uh, where they are. Thank you. And, and, and it's interesting how you're talking about the structure being um, a, a structure that you know, who's the onus on? So, you know, try, you know, mistrust or earn skepticism, it's on us. Um, Faith, when you're talking about who gets to decide, who's on study sections, who gets to decide what's a priority in a grant or what the priority RFA is. So what you're doing is you're, you're kind of not only talking about structures like pollution or residential segregation or racism, but also structures of power. Um, Renee, you wanna say something and then Neil? Yeah. Um, I think living within or near tribal communities is another way to gain trust, but also really learn the reasons behind why maybe genomics research is such a difficult topic to talk about or researchers are hard to engage with. I think it's important that, you know, researchers um, sort of gain that cultural humil humil humility and awareness and really 
learn from the community because they have something to say. And if you ever engage with, you know, older folks within, you know, indigenous communities, you know, they talk a lot and they have lessons to teach us, lessons to bestow upon, you know, researchers or just anybody within the community. And so I think, you know, also the funding needs to be there to put an emphasis on community engagement and let us do community engagement for five, 10 years. Um, and be able to fund people to come to the table and fund community members to be at the table and and to speak their mind because it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen, oh, you have one year to engage and then do your research. Um, and I've been through that cycle before and it, it doesn't work. So um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. So also, you know, who gets to control the timeline of research? Who gets included and when? Really, really important. Neil, you know, would you like to add to the structure? Sure. Yeah, I just follow up on the, some of the comments Renee just made and we talked about. Um, trust, as we've heard, trust is very important. And, and what, what engenders trust and what disengenders trust? Being honest with the people that you're working with and listening to them also in terms of their needs. And I'm going to give one example. <clears throat> we know that you know, the, Pimas, the Pima, Pima population of Arizona has a very high rate of diabetes and obesity. Um, there have been a lot of genetic studies done there. But the one thing I didn't mention before is by and large genetic Genetics are not modifiable risk factors, but the diabetes that, that, that they have is modifiable potentially by other interventions. And when you go to a community and you start talking about genetics, you know, um, you have to be forthright and honest in terms of how much it's actually going to benefit them in terms of the actual what they're living with currently, which is a very high rate of diabetes. You know, you have to be very honest about this. You know, the research is nice and it can lead to conclusions, but I don't think polygenic risk scores per se are gonna solve a diabetes problem among, among the Pima who will live in Arizona. It's much more complicated than that. And we've heard about gene environment interaction. We cannot give short shrift to the environment part because often that is a modifiable risk factor and often right. it's related to poverty. Right, so, so this idea that, you know, that genetics is important, but it's not everything and the environment is a lot of different things is really important. Okay, so we have, we've just um, maybe 15, 20 seconds to go around to the four of you one more time. And I'll, we'll go Faith, Kellen, Renee, Neil. And just if you have one message you could give the NHGRI about a direction on the forefront of genomics when it comes to structure and structural racism, what would you recommend? Okay, great question. Um, I would say that we're talking about benefits to communities as well as harms to communities, but I would also highlight it's important enough for this throughout that we think about um, benefits and harms to investigators. Um, doing this work. So if we want to recruit and retain a diverse workforce, we really have to think about who's benefiting, as we were saying earlier with these structures, especially related to large scale studies and large sample size, the ability to publish in high impact journals, to disseminate, disseminate the work, um, how that leads to promotion and tenure decisions. And we see disparities in terms of who's authoring those papers and who's a part of those groups. So thinking about ways to evaluate that, actually developing metrics to evaluate um, benefit to investigators, as well as thinking about how many diversity supplements and other training grants are coming out of some of these large scale grants if we're thinking about building the pipeline to increase diversity in the genomics workforce. Excellent point, thank you. Kellen? I want to similarly underscore the diversity of the genomics workforce. I would note there's an excellent paper out by Dr. L. Lett and co-authors that talks about health equity tourism and the degree to which there are, there's a lot of interest in health equity and that's wonderful. And also there's a great deal of expertise in communities. There's a great deal of expertise among researchers who come from those communities who historically have often been marginalized as uh, many of my fellow panelists have noted. Um, who have been marginalized in science. And so thinking about how do we support um, both the, the cultivation and the, the sharing of community expertise and community knowledge and the, the experience of researchers who can actually speak directly to the, the, that community knowledge. Um, I think it's just such a, an important way of keeping the balance between the focus on individual issues, precision medicine, for example, but having that broader structural perspective. It's never just your scientific question. There's right. so much that goes around it. Well said, and we'll try to put the health equity tourism uh, article in the chat in, in a few minutes. Thank you, Renee. Yeah, um, I think I have a couple. So it's uh, the onus of the researcher to do their homework, to engage with the community properly, to live within and around the community, to really understand them. 
Um, and to realize that if Native communities don't want to engage in genomics research and they are looking for something different, like getting clean water, getting access to water, um, getting affordable, healthy foods, um, having access to top tier education, things like that, then you need to be able to say, okay, I need to back off and do, you know, take my research elsewhere because Indigenous communities know what they need. And if they say no, then they say no. Thank you, very important. Neil, last comment? Yeah, I, <laughs> these are all great comments and everything Faith, Renee and Kellen said, I totally echo, I don't need to repeat them. Um, but again, I think it's really important to focus on the actual benefits. We've talked a lot about the harms, but I think to give a fair and accurate assessment of the benefits, you know, so people can understand them as, the, you know, as we heard earlier today from Dr. Hildreth, people can understand it, but we have to communicate, you know, accurately, correctly, and honestly. All right, thank you everybody. We're a few minutes over, but that makes up for our, our loss of connection earlier on. Um, and please take a look at the chat. There's a lot of interesting discussion going on and I will um, echo gratitude for all of you and for everybody who organized this and turn it back to Lucia. Thank you so much to all of the panelists and to you, Carol, for moderating a very stimulating discussion. Um, it's now time for us to go into breakout groups. I'm going to ask IT to come on in just a second and tell us a little bit more about the logistics. But first, I want to say to all of you that this is really um, everyone's chance, people who have gotten a chance to speak and those who haven't, to help um, come up with recommendations for NHGRI to develop a research agenda in genomics and health equity. So we have five breakout groups, and we're looking for each of the five to come up with up to two recommendations uh, to recommend to NHGRI. So please um, keep your, um, your comments and your discussion focused on that goal. That will help us to prioritize all of these really great ideas um, into things that NHGRI can do and things that we need to partner with other people to do. Um, so with that, I will ask Gerald to come on and um, review the logistics of the breakout groups. Okay, let's see. Um, okay. I am anyone from IT? Here. Oh, yes. Thank okay. you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties today, um, but in your chat, you will actually see um, all the five breakout rooms, okay? Um, you've registered or you are assigned one of the breakout rooms. If you click on the link, actually, um, it will take you to the breakout room. Okay, um, let me actually share the screen here. Whoops, I stopped sharing. Hold on. Share screen. Okay, so there's two ways uh, to get. The easiest way is to look in the chat and then click on that link um, of your breakout room that you're assigned to discussion group, and that'll take you to your uh, breakout room. Um, AV support is there ready and waiting for you. Um, and uh, um, the leaders will get there as well, too. The other thing is um, earlier today, you were sent a calendar invite. Um, you can actually look at that, and in there will actually be um, the link for getting into the meeting. Okay. And I will stay online here if there are any technical difficulties. Okay, so just to recap, people are going to click on a separate Zoom link to join their breakout rooms, and then we need everybody back. Um, at 1.30 Eastern to start the recap. So um, breakout group leaders, please help facilitate that if you can. Um, all right, so if people have questions, please ask um, Gerald, um, um, who will stay on to answer any questions. But other than that, we will send you off for some great discussion. Thank you, everyone. See you back at, at 1.30. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are starting to see people come back. Thank you um, all for your stimulating discussions in the various breakout rooms. Um, this is our time to do the recap of the recommendations developed by each of the breakout groups. And as a reminder, we asked breakout group chairs to share up to two um, per group. So that's gonna be 10 recommendations. We're gonna go through them very, very quickly. So um, basically um, no more than like a, a couple of minutes per group. Um, and so I'm going to go through these. I apologize. I, I um, 
I'm going to go through them in the order that I see them. Um, and I don't have the names of the breakout group chair, so hopefully you all remember. Um, let's go ahead and start with structural factors. Who's reporting back from that group? Do we have anybody from structural factors? Um, at Malia, is that your Malia. group? Malia. Oh, structural factors. Sorry. OK, I thought there was Apologies. one before us. No. Sorry, do you want me to, do, do, I thought there was one more um, before us, but if you would like me to go first, I'm happy to. Okay, apologies. I'm going from a list that I, I see here. It might, have, it might have been ordered in a different um, order. Are you, are you prepared to go or should I skip and come back to you? Uh, Jen is having some okay. technical issues, so maybe you can- um, Yeah, oh, I'll oh, show okay. minutes is ready. Yeah, we're ready. Social determinants. Okay, let's Social let's determinants. Social Thank determinants. you. Social determinants was who I thought was going Thank first. You. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very, Very good. Thank you so much. And thanks to the group who um, made the breakout discussion and identification of recommendations really uh, easy. So um, our recommendations are included here. And Nanaba, who co um, facilitated with me, will, will help me in discussing the second one. You know, um, something that must come first before these recommendations. Um, are actualized is developing um, a working group to take the short list of metrics that we began to, to brainstorm on in our breakout, metrics related to social determinants of health and genetics or genomics research, and to um, decide on the metrics that matter. Um, and that, that uh, brain trust should include researchers, it should include policy folks, and most importantly, it should com co include community and patient leaders in identifying what SDOH metrics uh, and measures matter. So once that happens, our first recommendation is that NHGRA require investigators to include training on using SDOH measures and a plan towards how they should be used, right? Uh, so we know that policies and systems matter and if there is a requirement of investigators uh, to learn about SDOH measures, and then with this new repository of metrics related to SDOH uh, that have been approved and, and um, um, agreed upon, then um, this first recommendation can really be realized and investigators would know what to do with them and where to go to find them. Nanaba? Thank you, Tavia. So we also, our group also recognized that many scientists and geneticists may not be super familiar with what social, social uh, determinants of health, social determinants of health might be and what kinds of measures those might be. So the recommendation was to provide initiatives using mechanisms that support long-term training opportunities to enable researchers, geneticists, and other people who are funded by NHGRI to study underrepresented populations using these um, social determinants of health measures. And so these long-term training opportunities can really enable uh, reach researchers to understand what these SDOH measures are and use them in a savvy way. So thank you. Okay, thank you. So apologies, I think I have found the list now. So I, I think um, structural factors is next. Is Are you ready? Yeah, I, I am. Um, what I'm a little unsure of, am I to share my screen or is it someone from NHGRI who, who has access to the slides? I can share my screen, but I just, I don't want to jump in if I'm not. Oh, I, I believe okay. Jen has the slides and I think she's in the middle of a thunderstorm. So okay. maybe without slides you can present or. Well, I, I, I can, I can bring the slides up. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, All thanks. Right. It'll be better if you do it. My internet keeps going out. Right, okay. All right, uh, so um, so yes. Hi everyone, Malia Fullerton, uh, University of Washington. I, I was uh, co-leading co this group uh, with Nita Limdi from UAB. Unfortunately, Nita had an emergency and was unable to join. And so the group was stuck with me. Uh, we still nevertheless had a, a really tremendous uh, conversation where a number of very important points were brought up uh, and we landed on three primary recommendations. There probably would have been more, but these are the ones that we ended up with. And many, many thanks for Jen, uh, for taking notes and, and helping us to get to this as quickly as we did. 
The first was uh, there was a consensus in the group that we need sufficient time and funding to allow for appropriate community engagement with appropriate review of, and progress reporting and criterion and, and, and that funding needs to be allocated equitably and in, to include community in the resources. And so this is a really big, you know, it, from a, thinking about structural limitations at the highest level. Uh, then there was an interesting uh, suggestion, perhaps, or we, there was discussion around this. This is one way of possibly approaching it, required training for researchers on diversity, sensitivity, and inclusion, uh, and, a, and a role perhaps for participant community members, both in individual research studies, as well as in NIH review and NHGRI decision-making. Uh, so that was a very interesting thought and recommendation. And then fi finally, there was an um, interesting um, call for, important call for collecting data at the earliest stages of research on wider abilities, demographics, so things that could be cast as resiliencies, as well as barriers to participation, vulnerabilities, as a standard reporting element and really prior to the initiation of a research study and to use this as part of education and improvement process. So not simply to kind of just do this in a checkbox kind of way, but use this to actually bring into the research process to help people uh, really design uh, research that will be more broadly inclusive. Um, and so, so those are the recommendations that our group came up with. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move on to implementation. Denise and Elizabeth. Uh, yes, trying to share my screen here. I'm not sure I know how to share my screen. You would think I would know this by now in the pandemic, but. Denise, I think I can, I think I can share my screen. Let's see. Make sure I share the right one. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, our the first recommendation, um, since this is focused on implementation science, is that um, research should always include a robust understanding of contextual variables, so where the research occurs, um, uh, and emphasize um, diverse settings. Um, engaging um, diverse stakeholders in the design and outcomes. Um, but there was also discussion that there also should be shared metrics across studies so we can assess whether or not health equity is being achieved. So um, it's important to understand, for example, that a, a research project um, may occur um, in New York City um, in the limitations of that knowledge, um, but that we should also be really trying to get out to, you know, rural sites that have that have fewer resources and really um, making sure that we're getting to all of those settings. Right, thank you. So um, I think there were definitely, as Denise shared, a lot of conversation around, you know, the communities and the, 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 the practices that are likely to have um, impact based on the health condition. And included in that was a uh, discussion around ensuring that the questions are relevant. And of course, as a part of that, I think we heard earlier today, who is asking the question. And so involving point of care clinicians as well as other members of the team uh, in understanding and communicating uh, genomic research um, using a health equity lens. And of course, um, the, the group also had discussion about how some of this language and literacy communication should be structured in a way that um, that information, including the outcomes of the research can be shared. Um, and so again, it's uh, drilling down to ensure that the clinicians that are frontline or point of care are involved as much as possible, either in participating and or participating and communicating specially actionable uh, genomics um, information. Thank you. Thank you. And then I think our next breakout is from data science, um, Jeff and Valentina. Great, thanks. Uh, we, uh, uh, this is Jeff Leak. Oh, they've, somebody has changed my name for me, which I appreciate. I was barring Valentina's link for a minute. Um, 
Thanks to the group for a really wonderful conversation and a very in-depth both synchronous and asynchronous combination. We, we also came up with three recommendations. The first is to diversify the genomics workforce in data science by targeting HBCUs, MSIs, tribal colleges, and community colleges, and thinking about increasing funding and support to these programs to build infrastructure and capacity, faculty, and leadership, especially acknowledging the unique circumstances for faculty at these institutions who may not have the same infrastructure that exists at large R1 um, research in institutions. Um, second was to develop funding and support for community-based research where participants are both contributors and beneficiaries uh, to create a more diverse uh, collection of data and acknowledging the needs of these communities in terms of data ownership and participation. There was a great comment about focusing on privileging participants and their perspective in order to support a more diverse data collection. And then lastly, to engage students earlier in the educational pipeline to attract students to computer and data science, exposing them to diverse scientists in high schools based on previously successful programs, uh, getting people excited about science um, in high schools, and then supporting them throughout their career process through graduate schools and, and on into faculty roles in data science. Um, so uh, there's a really rich conversation that was had around, you know, this is obviously a quick summary of a, a much richer conversation, but it was an outstanding uh, set of recommendations together by the group. Thank you very much. Um, and then I think the, the um, remaining breakout group is the LC group. Who is reporting back? Yeah, this is Catherine Hay McEveran, uh, my fantastic uh, co-leader, uh, Ben Wilfond. Um, so we had a very robust discussion. Uh, we came up with, um, I'm eyeballing like eight or nine different recommendations. We narrowed those down to two that we thought were the most pressing and the most important. Uh, so the first was um, diversifying uh, what LC sort of means who we are and what it is that we do. We also talked about um, engaging and outreach to um, different sort of fields that um, would contribute a lot of, of valuable insight, uh, specifically, you know, health economics, um, the, you know, humanities, social sciences. Um, we, we focused on sort of expanding and adapting the scope of what LC actually means in this particular context. And uh, that leads me to my, our second point, which is sort of um, this, what do you mean by phenomenon that we kept coming back to. And so one of our recommendations is um, developing, um, hopefully in, it, with a data-driven sort of evidence-based um, systematic process to identify and define what exactly it is that we mean by insert term. So what do we mean by um, health disparities? What do we mean by underrepresented and marginalized? What do we mean by even uh, equity? Uh, so, um, and tacking onto that, there was this sort of, um, this idea that over-focusing on outcomes could actually um, exacerbate uh, rather than mitigate certain health disparities. And so being, uh, intentional uh, about how we're defining and talking about and thinking about things to be sure we're all on the same page um, and also just being really precise in um, what it is that we do. Ben, I don't know if, did you wanna add, did I capture that? Sure, really well. I think I'll, the only thing I'll add very quick, very quickly, um, I don't think it made it to our top two list, but it's one that I dear to my heart, so I want to just take the chance to say it, which is really the, the particular focus on disability issues as one of the areas that is at great risk of being uh, adversely impacted by advances in genomics. And unless we really elevate that persistently, I worry a lot about that. Didn't make our top two, but it was, okay. I, I bring it up. Okay, so thank you. Does that wrap it up for Elsie? Okay, thank you so much. I, again, I wanna thank everyone for their thoughtful participation and especially to the breakout 
um, group leads for leading this fast-paced discussion. Um, to let everybody know, we're about to go into break and then come back at the top of the hour for two informational presentations on the Unite initiative and the All of Us presentation. So you'll get to learn a little bit more about what else is going on around the NIH um, in, in, in the area of health equity. And so um, after that, we will come back for a polling and prioritization. Um, so please be back at the top of the hour in whatever time zone you're at, and we will see you then. <laughs>